This is episode number 106, featuring artist Timothy Horn. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called plein air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it plein air. Others say plain air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping, and hey there, my name's Eric, and I'm an addict. Yep, I'm addicted to plein air painting. Welcome to the Plein Air Podcast, and thanks for being here. This podcast is brought to you by the Plein Air Convention, where you can learn from probably the largest art faculty in the history of art, 80, at least 80, of the world's best artists, giving you their ideas and techniques for about the same price you'd attend a normal workshop. This year, the convention is in San Francisco, we're also going to go up and paint in wine country. There's some amazing landscapes on the plan. And uh, the spring by the bay is absolutely amazing. Rich green hills, spring vines. It's a wonderful time to come. And you can become a better painter for the price of a single workshop. You can choose from classes and demos and speakers uh, from morning till night. One price gets you into everything. Observe as much or as little as you want. And we go painting every day together, too. And this year is homecoming. We're going to be doing some fun things with that. And we actually are coming up with some new outdoor painting ideas that we're going to do at this convention as well. That way you can paint close to the hotel if you don't want to travel around. Or you can go to some of our places that may require a little bit of drive. And we're also working on something for the indoors. So stay tuned for that. Anyway, sign up at plenairconvention.com. The interview is underwritten by Easel Brush Clip. The cool tool to clip onto your plein air studio or easel uh, holds brushes, keeps them right in your site, and it's one of those things you didn't know you needed till you get one. Check out the video at easelbrushclip.com. And coming up after the interview, I'll answer some art marketing questions. But first, let's get right to the interview with artist Timothy Horn. One of my all-time favorite painters at the moment is Timothy Horn. Timothy, welcome to the plein air podcast. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for having me. I love your work. I don't want to sound like a, a snot-nosed groupie, but I really, <laughs> really enjoy what you do. Well, thank you very much. So I think the the first time I, you really got my attention, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong on this because I may have the venue wrong, but I saw an Airstream painting that you had done, and I think it was maybe in a California Art Club show. Does that sound right? Um, that could have been, or maybe it was a Napa Valley art festival. I think I saw you there once. Anyway, I'm not sure, but anyway. I, I've done a, a number, quite a number of Airstream paintings. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious about that. I, I grew up with an Airstream, so I have a, you know, we uh, used to go you? camping in an Airstream. So I have a, an affinity for those. How did that uh -huh. whole thing start for you? Well, that was kind of random. Um, I was, uh, I live up in Marin County, just north of San Francisco, and I was headed into San Francisco one day to, to go painting. I was going to go up in the Potrero Hill neighborhood. And I was uh, driving into town, and I, I passed this, down one of the side streets, I saw this Airstream trailer, and I had never painted one before. And this one, um, it was extremely shiny, had just been polished. And I, I just pulled over and got out and took a few photos of it and then uh, got back into my truck and continued on and went and painted something else. And it wasn't until probably two or three years later that I was looking through my photos and I saw those photos of that Airstream and I thought, I, I think I'm going to try to paint this. I had a, my first solo show in a gallery was, was in six months or so and so... Um, so I did that painting of that trailer, and I, it was really fun to try to, to get that reflection, and uh, it turned out to be a, a good painting. And when the gallery director was trying to uh, decide what image to put on the postcard, I had 
suggested a couple of other paintings to choose from. And she said, what, what about this Airstream painting? And I said, oh, well, it's not my favorite, but yeah, I'll go with that. I'll trust your, your uh, objective viewpoint. And so we did that, and it was very popular. And so I've, I've done many, many Airstream paintings since then. Well, it looks like a very difficult subject to paint, is it? Um, it is kind of tricky. I mean, it's it's the the thing to realize, or the thing that that early on that I realized that kind of made it a little bit easier for me is that it's basically just a big convex mirror. So if you're if you've got cobalt in your sky then the top of the trailer, that blue in there is going to be cobalt based. And if you've got a warm gray on the street, that street is going to be, that's those same colors are going to be reflected in the lower part of the trailer. So the, the colors that are around that are the, that make up the setting are going to be the same colors that are reflected in the trailer. So that kind of took a lot of the mystery out of it for me, but still there's the, the rendering, you know, getting that reflection right and those highlights and then trying to somehow indicate those rivets and the, the various other aspects of the trailer. Well, I, I, I have never tried that, but it looks very challenging to me. Of course, you've got, <laughs> you've got all this curvature going on and your, your reflections are curved and, and pretty, yeah. pretty interesting. And, and I didn't intend to talk about Airstream paintings, but I, I am <laughs> kind of curious about it. So how did this journey begin for you? Well, um, as a kid, I had always been interested in art, like many other painters, and um, and I decided to go to art school after I spent a, a year at Ohio University my freshman year, but I really, really wanted to go to art school. I had spent a summer at Parsons School of Design in New York, and that just got me really excited about the idea of going to art school. So... I did a year at OU and then dropped out and started making my applications to art school, got into the Cooper Union School of Art in New York, and um, my focus was graphic design. So that's all I wanted to do. I was absolutely passionate about it, and I just, I just loved design. So um, when, I was, when I was at Cooper, you know, you have all kinds of required classes, sculpture and drawing, photography and painting, but I, I just had no interest in painting at the time whatsoever. I really wanted to do graphic design. It's kind of ironic because some people go to art school and they want to be a painter, but they feel they've got to be practical in order to make a living. So they study graphic design to, to be able to, you know, get a job when they get out of school, but it was the complete opposite for me. And then um, once I graduated, I started working in the field of graphic design in various design firms in New York City. And, um, but, you know, I, I love the experience of art school because you're just doing art all day long. And you're not just doing one kind of art. You're doing painting, photography, sculpture, color, just all kinds of stuff. But then once I, once when I got out in the field... I had a desk that I had to sit at for hours and hours, and I had clients and deadlines, and uh, there was so much more business and production involved in the creation of these design pieces than there had been in art school that it, it wasn't as creatively fulfilling for me. It wasn't, it wasn't enough. So almost immediately, I started taking continuing at night classes in art and and art and design and all kinds of things. Whatever I could find, I took stained glass and jewelry making, industrial design, watercolor, photography, just anything. And um, then I, I continued to work as a designer, eventually moved to San Francisco, continuing to do design and taking night classes. I really got into black and white photography for a while. And then I found furniture making, and I really got into that heavily. I, did, I took classes in furniture making for six and a half years. And I got into a little bit of boat building, and uh, then just kind of on a whim, I thought, I, I, maybe I'll try a painting class. And I t it was a figure painting class in San Francisco, and I liked it, but I thought, you know, maybe, maybe landscape is more my kind of thing, because I liked being outside. So I took a landscape painting class, and I really liked it a lot. And um, 
and then I was uh, riding my bike in West Marin one day, training for a cross-country bike ride, and I came across this group of painters, and I just pulled over and said, Who, who's in charge here? What's going on? And I found that the instructor was Stanley Goldstein. He lived in San Francisco, and he was teaching this weekly class out in, the, out in Marin. And I said, all right, when I'm done with my ride in six months, I'm going to call you and I'm going to join your class. So I did, and I, and I studied with him for, for about a year, once a week for about a year. And um, it was, I just feel so fortunate to have met him at that time because um, it was just, I had just taken one painting class, and I had no idea what I was doing. Because of my design background, I felt fairly comfortable with composition, but in terms of color, I had just absolutely no clue about how to see and paint color accurately. And Stanley was so good with that and just trying to slowly lead me through that process and, and um, get me into it. And so after a couple months with, with Stan, I was absolutely hooked, and that's all I wanted to do. How long ago was that? Uh, that was in, I think it was 1998. Okay. So it's been about 20 years now. Yeah, okay. Well, it's it's about the time I was living in San Francisco, and it's about the time I discovered plein air painting. Interesting. And we never met out there. <laughs> we met later, but we didn't meet when, when, when I was nope. living out there. Right? No. Nope. Yeah. So uh, how would you describe yourself to the people who might not have had a chance to look at your website, which is timhornart.com? How would you describe yourself? as a painter? Well, um, I get asked that question occasionally and I'm never sure how to, how exactly to answer it, but I, I do like to paint structural things, man-made objects, buildings, and I do a lot of buildings and cars, vehicles, um, old trailers. And then I've done a, also done a, a number of, uh, ranch scenes. I, partic I participate in a an annual show out here that benefits the Marin Agricultural Land Trust. Oh, the mulch show. Um, right. Yeah. So for that, I, I do ranch paintings. So, and I've been participating in that show for, I don't know, 12 or 14 years now. So every spring I'll do maybe 10 or 12 ranch paintings. And um, so that's, that's, become a really a regular and wonderful experience to go out there and paint those ranches. You know, I, I, I think that people assume uh, that if, if you live in the San Francisco area that it's all concrete and hills and buildings, the landscapes around that area are stunning. I used to go up to Marin. Uh, I lived in the East Bay uh, mm -hmm. out in the Walnut Creek area. But I used to go up to Marin all the time. As a matter of fact, I went to also went up to st study with Camille Preswadek on Mondays for two oh, years, yeah. every Monday, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great way to learn about color. And yeah. uh, but the the landscape surrounding the city, it's just so vast. There's so much. It really is. It's an incredibly rich area, and so in terms of subject matter. Um, that's that's one of the thrilling things about moving here from from New York City, that I could I get uh, I was living in the Haight at the time, and um, I could get in my car and in maybe 30 minutes I could be in the Marin Headlands, which is just pristine, beautiful, untouched landscape with dramatic ocean views. I mean, it's just astounding that that was only 30 minutes away from downtown San Francisco. Yeah. Whereas in New York City, it would take you like two hours to in fighting through difficult traffic in order to get to a place of natural beauty like that. So there is so much in the Bay Area. Um, and you can go to the rolling hills of the wine country or the dramatic ocean coastline of West Marin or some little uh, farm towns up in Marin. So there, there's, there's so much. And then San Francisco itself has a lot to offer. I've painted in uh, the Presidio and Fort Mason and then um, different various neighborhoods up there. There's just, there's great stuff all over the place. 
Yeah, it's it's pretty incredible. I, that's one of the things I loved about living out there is that I could go 30 minutes in any direction and get, uh, you know, a complete change of scenery. It's kind of, I think it's why they make yep. so many movies out there is because, you know, <laughs> if you want a city scene, you can go into the city. You want the country, you've got that. You've got the ocean. You have just so much variety. Yep. Yeah, and then another thing is, is the fog, you know, San Francisco has a reputation for being foggy and it, and it often is in the summertime particularly, but it might be 50 to go 50 degrees and, and, uh, foggy in San Francisco, you go over the golden gate bridge into Marin County and it'll be 80 degrees and sunny and it's only 30 or 40 minutes away. So if you're fogged in, in the city, it's a, just a short drive away to get to sunshine. Yeah, I, I used to, I, I worked in the city, and I um, so I'd take a change of clothes because it'd be 90 degrees. I'd be wearing shorts when I got on the train, and I'd <laughs> get into the city, it'd be 30 degrees. <laughs> yep, yep. Yep. So um, I, I'm curious now about teaching. Are you doing much of that at, at, at this time? Are you doing workshops? Yeah, I do probably four or five a year. You know, my, my wife works full time and I still have two boys at home. Um, so there's a, a lot of things I need to do around the house. So I really try to limit my time away from home. So I, I try to just limit it to four to five workshops a year. Yeah. Well, that's probably best anyway, because it's, it's hard to keep up that lifestyle of being on the road all the time, as you probably can imagine. It is. It's it's fun to travel and paint, but it is exhausting and, and stressful. So how much plein air work do you do versus studio work? Well, it's uh, it's funny. When I started painting, I only painted outside for probably two years. And I, I can't remember what started it, but I, I after two years or so, I, I decided I'd paint in the inside from a photo. And now, 20 years later, I would say probably... 80% of my work is done in the studio from photographs, and then the rest is, is plein air. And do you ever do uh, paintings from the plein air studies? I do. I do. And, you know, I had heard that for years that people would go out and do studies and then come back and do a painting. And I just thought, oh, that's, you know, there's so much more information in a, in a photograph that You've, you've got to be able to get more out of a photo than you could from a plein air study. But I had an experience once where I did this painting up in uh, Sonoma during the Sonoma plein air event. And it was of a red barn in a golden field with these beautiful clouds overhead. And I, and I cranked that thing out in probably an hour. And I loved that little painting. And I sold it, and I thought, I, I really want to paint this again, but bigger. And I'll, I'll just do it from photos in the studio so a few weeks later i i started to stretch a, a bigger canvas and started to work on it. i had a photo of the painting that i had done and then i had a reference photo of the actual scene and within a short time i realized that i was getting nothing out of the photo and all of the useful inf information was coming from that study that i had done out in the field so that was a real revelation to me. There's, you know, when you're outside, you just can see the color more accurately, or you can see color where from a photo, you can't see any color, especially in the shadow areas. They tend to go dark and very colorless. Whereas when you're outside, you can say, oh, maybe that's, a, maybe that's orange in that shadow or purple. But from a photo, it just m might look like a, a dead gray color. So... Talk to me about shadows because that's a difficult subject for for a lot of people. Um, you know, there, Oster used to used to talk about um, cool and warm and warm and cool, and and he was very controversial in the approach that he took. Um, <laughs> what what's your philosophy? Well, my my general feeling about shadows. I mean, I, first of all, I have to say I'm a sunny day painter. I generally only like to paint when it's sunny out. Um, but, and so on the sunny days on a, when you've got a clear blue sky, generally those shadows will be cool. They'll have an influence from that blue sky. 
Um, so that's that's how I approach it. But, you know, you can see all kinds of colors in the shadows, and sometimes you'll see warm colors in those shadows. And I've heard people say that when it's overcast or foggy, that, uh, that the warm, cool uh, combination reverses, that the lights will be cool and the shadows will be warm. But as a sunny day painter, painter um, I generally have my shadows cool and uh, if they're exposed to that blue sky they'll have a blue influence in them. Now I've noticed also that you're um, it, it, as I was kind of flipping around at, on your website and looking at some of the things um, first off you're putting a lot of color in your shadows and and also some lighter edges on shadows typically not always. Talk to me about mm -hmm. that. Well the um the edges of the shadows, that's, that's kind of a, that's a fairly new thing for me. Sometimes when I'm, when I'm painting a shadow, whether it's from, from a photo or from life, right where that shadow meets the light, I'll see some color along that edge. And sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. But I've, I've just found from experience that that's an opportunity to introduce a a color, another color at that edge. Even if you don't actually see it there, you can introduce another another color there, and it makes it more interesting. Um, it's a, uh, I think the, and I'm not the only one to be doing this. Of not, course, not my idea. Um, Kim English, he's he's big on using kind of a, a orange color along his edges of shadows. And that, that looks great, and so I often use orange, but other times I've, I've used a, a more cerulean blue or sometimes a, a violet purple. So, it, you know, I just experiment and try diff many different things with that, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Well, there's a concept in figure painting, which uh, I don't know the technical term, but it's uh, oftentimes they call it the bed bug line, and it's essentially where the shadow and the light meet. And mm -hmm. there's an intense amount of chroma at that particular spot. Some people fake it. Some people say they see it. But right. it's, it's very similar in that regard because you're taking where light meets shadow and putting a, a more intense color there, and it, it seems to work. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. I'm working on a, a series of um, what I call shadow selfie paintings now where I'm <laughs> – <laughs> I know it sounds kind of crazy, but I'm I'm uh, most of the time I'm standing near an old car with the sun directly behind me, so that my shadow is being cast onto this vehicle, and it's usually a, a bright color. And in those situations, I notice that there usually is a really strong color right at the edge of that shadow. So it's really fun to to kind of play that up and and see what happens with it. And so your shadow is bending and curving over the the old car. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. It's following the contours of the car, but then also within the shadow you see reflections. So there's this whole another level of stuff that happens within that shadow. And you see highlights in there, so it's a really crazy kind of thing. I did one painting of an old Renault that I had found in a in a little town in France. And my shadow was cast onto the hood of this old green car. And I started working on a painting that was 36 inches square. And it wasn't until I was partway into the painting that I realized there was a reflection of me inside my cast shadow. And so that, um, that just introduced a whole other element to the, to the painting that I hadn't even realized when I first looked at it. And what what you know cars i find difficult and um the your work is very convincing it's not um it, it uh, it's not tightly tightly rendered um mm -hmm. but it feels tight it you know from a distance it feels tightly rendered but what's the key to painting a car especially like an old car with you know is is there something that you've learned that that would make it easier because i i particularly find it very difficult um, I find it very difficult too, and I'm afraid I haven't. All these years of painting them, I have not come across any little tricks on, on how to do it, um, how to get it more easily. It to me, painting an old car, 
is just as difficult as painting a figure. If you don't get the, the drawing right or the proportions accurate, people notice it. It's very, very easy to spot. So it's, um, you know, it's the painting process for me is just a, a constant refinement of that drawing. You know, when I, when I start a painting, I'll block it in very loosely. But as I work through the painting, I'm, I'm try constantly trying to just get the drawing more and more accurate as I go while still maintaining a, a painterly quality to it. My, my hope is that I can render it accurately, but with a painterly hand. You know, I want it to, to look like a painting. I want it to feel, you know, painterly and have brush strokes in it and some energy, but at the same time be accurately drawn and, and accurate proportions and all that. So do you find that you're more successful today than you were like, I don't know, 10 years ago? Are you, are, are, are you nailing more of them or do you still have as many turkeys? What? Well, it's funny, you know, uh, 15 years ago, I was doing a lot more plein air painting than I do now. So for me, when I go outside and paint, I've, I've got a pretty low success rate out in the field. Uh, and that can be very frustrating, but uh, I've come I've come to just kind of accept that, so that when I go outside to paint, I just assume that I'm gonna get a lousy painting, and that kind of takes the pressure off me. I, I just you know it's just a little psychological game I play with myself, but it really has been very helpful, so that I'm not feeling the pressure to try to get a good painting when I go outside. Well, what are you trying to get? Well, I, it's it's basically just exercise for me. I mean, I, painting in the studio versus outside is a very, very different experience. And I um, I don't have any galleries right now that that are really appropriate to sell my small plein air paintings in. But I really want to keep painting plein air because I think it's just it's good for me. So I, I force myself to get out there and paint. But it's really just for me, and it's just for fun. And every now and then I, I get a good one, but most of them I'll um, I'll be disappointed with, and I'll maybe I'll try to fix them back in the studio. But I'm I'm okay with uh, them not turning out and wiping them down. That's that's completely fine with me. All right. So when when you're teaching, uh, what do you find are the things that you're most able to contribute to the people that are attending? Well, um, people often take my workshop because they, they like how I capture the light in a scene. So I, I spend a lot of time trying to share with them how I do that. And I'm not the only one capturing the light in the scene. I mean, a lot of people are out there doing that same thing. But, but everybody's got a slightly different approach to it. Well, your values are spot on, and, and they do feel very sunny. You do get that sense of that sunny day. And sometimes you've got these, the, the feel of you're looking right into the sun. You know, it's silhouetting against a house, and you've got that kind of that gradation thing going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so when I work with students on on that, it's it's definitely a values thing. That's that's number one. That's probably one of the biggest uh, things that we work on in in workshops. But in combination with that, I spend a lot of time talking about no tans and having them do the little exercises with no tans. And that's basically where you take a scene and you divide it into areas of light and areas of shadow. And, and so I try to get them to uh, either when they're, whether they're going outside and working from life or working from, from photographs, I want them to be able to look at that scene and break it down in their mind or in their eye to areas of light versus areas of shadow. So I have them do these little exercises and I, you know, I really pound that into their heads and most people come out of there saying that they look at the world in a different way. And so I feel like I'm, I've successfully um, gotten through to them on that. If they go out there and they, they're looking at a scene and trying to think about how to paint it, if they think about that no tan, that value pattern before they start painting, because it, it makes it, um, it just makes it a lot easier 
to paint if you've got a good value pattern, a good no tan design to work from. And if so, if you're painting on a on an overcast day, that no tan is it's a very different way that that is structured. But on a sunny day, you've got areas of light and areas of shadow that create this design. And the more interesting and bold that design is, the easier time you're going to have with doing your painting. So. I'm curious about the influences of all these other things that you've done before you started painting, um, especially graphic design and composition, but also things like um, stained glass or furniture making. How, mm -hmm. how did that all impact what ultimately has become the feel of your work? Can you articulate any of those things? Well, I'm not sure that... Uh... Stained glass has had any effect, or even <laughs> or furniture making, as as much time as I spent doing that. Um, but definitely, graphic design has. I mean, as a designer, you're faced with that eight and a half by eleven piece of paper every day, all day long, and so you just, or I feel like I I just developed this sense of composition because I was faced with that rectangle every day. And you just start moving around words and letter forms and images, and you do it so that until you reach a achieve a, a pleasing arrangement. And so when I and it's not like they really, you know, I feel like in art school I wasn't really um, taught composition in terms of graphic design. It's just something that slowly developed over 20 years of doing it. So that once I started painting. You know that that came fairly easily to me. I was I was comfortable with figuring out a composition. Um, you know, I, I definitely had a lot of uh, experienced a lot of growth in that area since then. But it wasn't something I struggled with early on. It was more color that I had just no clue about what I was doing. And and what do you what do you think are the keys to getting color right? Um. Boy, you know, I, I think painting, miles and miles of painting, just doing it all the time. And painting from life, I think, is much, much uh, more useful in terms of seeing a painter painting color accurately than working from photos. So, it, you know, when I first went out there, um, you know, you look at a tree trunk, and, and uh, I had no idea what color that really was. I knew from first grade that it was supposed to, you're supposed to use the brown crayon for the tree trunk. But once you start painting it, you realize it's not brown. It's a completely different color. And it took me years to be able to, to see and paint that color accurately. And I guess um, one thing that I can, one specific thing that I can point to is, is the blues, the influence of a blue sky on a scene. I remember taking a class and and the instructor was painting these distant hills and he was making it kind of a purple color. And I, I asked him, I said, you don't you don't really see those hills as purple, do you? And he said, um, actually, yeah, I do. And that was a real surprise to me, because to me, those those hills were covered with trees, so they had to have some kind of green in them. But you know, years, 15, 20 years later, that's all I can see in those hills is blue. And so I, I have my students, uh, I have these little tools called color isolators. It's basically a white piece of paper with a hole punch in it. And I have them look at, you know, if they're having trouble uh, seeing the color of something, I have them look through that hole over that, that object, look through that hole into that object that they're seeing, like a distant hill. And that helps them see what color it is. So if you're looking at a distant hole, or excuse me, a distant hill, look through that hole, that thing is blue. And it's very clear and strong that it's a blue. But if without that, if you're looking at a hill and you, and you see that it's covered with trees, you're going to think that there's green in there when there may in fact not be green in there. Yeah, your mind is tricking you into believing it's green. It really is. You've, you've really got to squash those preconceived notions about about color and what you assume are in those areas and really try to see what's in there and instead of thinking about it. Now, what about um, color harmony, color balance? Do you ever try to do anything like that or are you just doing everything by instinct? 
Uh, it's really by instinct. You know, I, I don't have formal training in painting. I mean, I've taken workshops and read books and all that, but there, you know, it's funny after doing it for this long there, I feel like I come across things now and then, and I feel like, Oh, I, I never, I never got the memo on that. And color <laughs> harmony is one of those areas where I just somehow missed it in the books or the lectures or whatever I was getting my information from. I never, never really got a read the chapter on color harmony. Um, so I don't put a lot of effort into achieving color harmony in my paintings. I, I've got maybe 10 colors on my palette. And, uh, you know, the fewer colors you've got on your palette, the more likely I think you are to naturally achieve color harmony. But I, I really don't, honestly don't give any thought to that when I'm painting. I'm, I'm really just going for basing it on observation and, and what, what feels light and what feels right instinctively. So how do you push yourself? How do you kind of take yourself to the next level or do you? Um, yeah, you know, I, um, I am not one to, uh, find a comfort zone and stay in that early on. I, I was doing a lot of paintings of old trucks and they were selling well and I started to get a reputation for painting those, but um, at, that kind of made me want to veer away from that. So I'm always trying to paint new things, and it's not like it's a, a conscious effort. I just, in going going through the world, um, I just come across things that excite me and interest me and, and that I want to try to explore in paint. And, um, for example, one of those areas is, what I call my sun flare paintings, which I think you mentioned earlier, where you're I'm painting a scene where you're looking directly into the sun, and sometimes the sun is just behind the edge of a building or a tree or a hill or something. And so I think I did my first one of those maybe eight years ago or so, and it was very difficult and not terribly successful. But I think it's the, the challenge or you know, how difficult it is, that gets me excited about it. Like, I want to figure that out. So I've I've probably done 20 or 30 or 40 sun flare paintings since then, and, and I've, I understand them a little bit better now. And so it's, um, you know, that's, that's just one series that I explored, and it, it was a very rich experience, and they're fun and really challenging to do. But, um, you know, after you've, spent weeks, months, years doing it, then you start to uh, find other things that excite, excite you. Or, so so you, you're making a full-time living as a painter, correct? I am, yeah. I, um, you know, I was uh, self-employed as a graphic designer for close to 20 years. And uh, so when I, when I got into painting and started selling through galleries and things, I started doing more and more painting and less and less design. I had that flexibility because I was self-employed. And, um, and at one point I was, uh, I realized I was doing graphic design two days a week or no, I was doing graphic design three days a week and painting two days a week, but I was making more money and having more success and more fun with the painting. And I was having more opportunities come along for my painting work than graphic design. And I thought, well, this is, this is silly. I, this is clear that I can, I think I can somehow make the transition into painting. So in um, 2006, I shut down my design business completely and went painting full time. But it, you know, it wasn't a, I mean, it, it was definitely a little bit scary to make that transition but as I said, I had been self-employed for 20 years, so I was used to the ups and downs of, of that. And I had, uh, you know, as a self-employed person, you learn to do all the marketing and the bookkeeping and finding new clients and meeting deadlines, just doing that whole thing. So when I switched over to painting, it, it was all the same stuff. It was just a different product. Right. So it wasn't a huge, huge leap for me because I had been self-employed for so long. I had never um, 
uh, I had never had a, you know, an employer where I, I worked for years with benefits and, and all these other things. So I was never making a ton of money with all these benefits that would have made it much more difficult to abandon that and go out on my own. That would have been much, much more difficult and scary. So what what is your best advice to somebody who decides they want to kind of transition out of maybe they're employed by somebody else? You obviously haven't been in that world exactly, but uh, what would you tell people as a way to transition from one into the other? Well, if you've got an ability to um, – or continue working part time, then that's great. You know, hang on to that because that'll be a, a good foundation for you to expand your, you know, work on your painting and expand the, the different areas and ways you can make money doing painting. It's very difficult to make a living as a painter. I love my job, but it is it is hard, and uh, it takes a a lot of effort and a certain kind of personality. To, um, to be able to do that. And I feel very fortunate to be able to make a living at a pain, as a painter, but it, it is, it is hard. Um, so if, if, you know, if there's a way that you can continue to work um, at something else that'll, that'll give you, provide you with some income during the lean times of painting, that's great. And that'll, that'll make it easier and kind of take the pressure off your painting. I um, I I think back to the early days when, uh, before I was in galleries, and I was still doing graphic design and and just painting for fun. I look back at those days now with uh, envy because I didn't have to make paintings that would that would sell. You know, I could just paint whatever I wanted in order to grow as a painter and, um, and just follow my whims and desires and just paint anything. Whereas now I've got this little voice in the back of my head that's constantly there um, trying to you know, make suggestions and, and influence what I paint and make sure that it, I might be able to sell it in a, in a gallery. So, you know, that's always a controversial subject because, the, you know, there are people who want to paint what they want to paint um, versus painting what sells. How do you deal with that? Yeah, that is a tricky one. And I've, I've really tried um, in the last couple of years to, uh, to squash that little practical voice in my head and do, do more paintings for me because I feel, you know, um, you know, my my old truck paintings they might sell, but they're they're gonna not uh, they're not gonna help me grow as a painter, and that's really what I want to do ultimately is just continue down that path of of uh, growth as a painter. Um, so you know, I read a quote years ago. I can't remember where I saw it, but it it said, um, "You want you don't cater to the audience, inspire them." And I think that's a great quote. It inspires me. It it makes me think. Okay, people people say they want a painting of an old truck, but really they maybe want something else. And I just have to show them what that is. So that kind of helps me push into new areas that that maybe aren't as uh, commonly painted. Well, it's that, not you, it's not the old truck. It's not the subject matter. It's how it's painted. It's how it's telling a story. It's how it's speaking to them and how it resonates in their heart or their mind that, mm-hmm. is, that is really what's moving them to, towards a painting. Absolutely. You know, one of the, the nicest compliments I had was, uh, I think it was my first solo show at a gallery, and I had this painting of an old pink station wagon from the 50s. It's like 16 by 20. And this woman came up to me. She had been looking at the painting. She came up to me and she said, you know, I am not a car, car person at all, but I love that painting. So that, that's really a wonderful compliment for someone to see a painting of a subject that normally would not interest them at all, but because of the way it's interpreted or painted or rendered, they really fall in love with it. Yeah, you're helping that. them see the world through your eyes. Exactly. Something yeah, they may that, not have ever noticed before. Right, right. And, you know, people... Um, People say that you, you know, painting and learning how to paint is kind of a two-part 
process where you spend the first part just learning how to paint, how to use the materials and the medium and figure out how to render what's in your head or what's in front of you. And then the second part is figuring out what you want to say. So I feel like now I am in the early stages of figuring out what I want to say. And it's, it's, so in order to do that, I really have to squash that voice in my head about what's practical or what might sell in a gallery and really try to, to push myself to tap into that personal vision of mine that is somehow unique to me and is just unlike anybody else. And it's, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. I've heard it described as it's a very quiet voice within you, and you've got to somehow be open to that voice and listen for that and really pay attention to that in order to tap into that, that inner vision that we all have. Because we all are people with unique history and a unique background to, different from everybody else. So your viewpoint, everybody's viewpoint is going to be different from everybody else's. So it's a, it's a, it, but it can be a challenge to find that voice and not kind of uh, gravitate toward other painters whose work you like or you find inspiring because that may not necessarily um, line up with what, you're, what you have to say, what value you have to, what unique, unique vision you have to bring to the table. Well, it's also can be very frightening when you think about it. I, I remember uh, no names mentioned here, but I remember a painter who kind of got pigeonholed into a particular type of painting that everybody loved. And, you know, he mm -hmm. was selling extremely well. And then uh, he did a show that was a complete rapid departure away from all of that. And he spent two years on the show and mounted this show as at a significant gallery. And nothing sold and, mm -hmm. and 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 because the people who came to the show were people who had fallen in love with the painter that he used to be not mm -hmm. necessarily the painter he had become those paintings yeah. eventually all sold but it took a lot longer than normal because it had to essentially find a new audience right right yeah that that's clearly a, a devastating experience to have that because you'll spend years, you might spend years developing this new direction and this huge body of work and then to have it um, met with um, mediocre response in the gallery is, is very, very disappointing. Well, it so can I, also I, be though, you know, that, that uh, the galleries uh, tend to have audiences that like particular things, and that's why they go to that particular gallery. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's a matter of, you know, finding finding a home that's appropriate for the style. Right, right, yep. Yeah, it's always a, a difficult balance. Sometimes now when I, when I do a show, um, you know, I'm constantly on my mind is where these paintings are going and what they're going to look like as a body of work. And uh, the, the, I'm interested in selling, of course, as many of them as I can. But if I feel like I'm going down the, the path of uh, painting too much with the gallery in mind, I try to make sure that I do at least one painting that is really personal and is just for me and that I just assume is not going to sell. And so that, that always feels good to be able to throw that one in there um, just to – you know, have my mark on it. And do you ever feel like you ever have those moments when you're painting and you're going, you're, you like do something and you're like, wow, everybody's going to love this. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Absolutely. And oftentimes um, my favorite two or three paintings in a show will not sell. And that always surprises me. And the one you hate but, the most is the one that sells first. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's, it, it's completely unpredictable. Yeah. And I, you know, I do a, a calendar every year and I, I choose the images for the calendar from the previous year's work that I've done. And so I'll, I'll pick my 12 favorite paintings from the past year. And when I put the, to the calendar together, which I just did a couple of weeks ago, um, I see that I usually find that 
three quarters of the paintings have not sold, even though they are my favorite 12 of the year. Maybe eight of them have not sold yet. And that always surprises me. But it's just, it's completely unpredictable. Well, that's and, what and makes, sometimes, it, makes it fun. It's what keeps it challenging. Exactly, exactly. Sometimes I'll, I'll do one that I really like, and it will be the first one to come off the wall. But you just, you just never know. Yeah, you never know. That's right. Well, any final tips or advice um, that you want to share with everybody? Well, um, I guess a common thing I, I hear from people when they, they go out to paint, especially the people that are fairly new to plein air painting, is they feel overwhelmed. You know, they go out there to a, a park or something and they just feel absolutely overwhelmed at, at everything that's in front of them. And so my advice to deal with that or to help with that is to use a viewfinder, which is something I've been doing since the, the very beginning. When I, when I first started painting outside, I used a little 35-millimeter slide mount with the film popped out of it. And that, that helped me, but I found that I was uh, holding it very close to my eye, and it just – it was too, the edges were too fuzzy and you really couldn't see what was within your, your viewfinder, your framework. So I made myself some larger um, viewfinders where the, the hole in the, the window in that viewfinder is maybe two by three inches or something like that. So whenever I go out to paint now, I'll use that viewfinder and I have different viewfinders for every proportion canvas that I work on. And I'll walk around a scene and I'll hold up that viewfinder looking at my potential subject matter, and I find that that instantly breaks it down into shapes because I want that, you know, you're looking at the sky. It's the sky it becomes a shape instead of an endless thing. It's a, a shape at the top end of your painting, and that road at the bottom of your painting, that becomes a road shape. It's not an endless road. So it, it really helps to to convert that huge world in front of you to a two-dimensional surface where you've got puzzle pieces of these large shapes that fit together and to really focus on rendering those shapes and getting those values right of those shapes before you get into the detail. Makes sense. And then and uh, whenever I do a painting, I always do a pencil sketch before I start with a painting, whether I'm working from photos in my studio or or outside. I have my viewfinder and sometimes I hold it up to my computer screen and try to figure out a composition there. And then I'll do a little 10 or 15 minute sketch in my sketchbook. It just helps me warm up to the scene and uh, see what kind of drawing challenges I'm going to have and just converts it to 2D and just helps me figure out values and composition and all that stuff. It's become a just an absolutely indispensable part of my painting process is that little preliminary pencil sketch. Well, and you're working out all the problems in advance rather than getting about halfway through the painting and going, oops, I should have moved this over two inches. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And when I work with my students, I know I, I uh, encourage them to do little pencil sketches too. And if I can get to them after they've done the sketch, but before they've started the painting, we are often able to work out a couple of uh, potential problems that I see in their sketch that they can avoid in the painting. So that, I think, can be a, a very useful part of the whole process. Good advice. Well, Tim, this has been great having you on the Plein Air Podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time today. I'm, a, uh, like I said, a big fan of your work. And uh, um, one of these days, I'll have one of those Airstream paintings hanging in my collection. So. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. That would be great. Well, thanks very much for having me, Eric. It has been fun, and I look forward to seeing you in San Francisco. Yeah, well, we're all coming out there. We're going to, because I started the magazine uh, when I was living in San Francisco, I'm calling this plein air convention homecoming and i'm hoping everybody who's ever been will come and all the instructors who have ever been will come and we're going to all kind of get together and celebrate it in uh, san francisco so i'm looking forward to it and and uh i'll be out there uh in, in a couple of weeks probably to uh do a little bit of site selection so maybe we'll connect then okay yeah that would be great all right thank you sir all right thank you eric 
Well, thanks again to Timothy Horn. I've got to get one of those Airstream paintings. Guy's amazing. He doesn't just do Airstream paintings, but they're pretty incredible. Anyway, should we do some marketing now? This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, Proven Techniques to Turn Your Passion into Profit. So here's a question from KC of Onalaska, Washington. I hope I got that right. She says, coming from a life of entrepreneurial marketing efforts, I have found that marketing becomes time consuming and it interferes with me doing my art. Is it possible to do both marketing and art well? How do I manage to do both time-wise? Well, that's a loaded question. Is it possible? Yes, there are many, many, many hundreds, probably thousands of artists who do it well. And if you look through art history, some of the painters who became known were really good at marketing. Mastering marketing is a really important thing. How do you manage it time-wise? Well, we'll talk about that. First off, you need to consider that as an artist selling your artwork, you're really self-employed. You're running a small business. There are thousands of one-person small businesses out there. For instance, if you owned, let's say, a yard service and you were the only person mowing, well, you'd have to find time to get customers and you'd have to find time to mow and to balance your checkbook and wear the other hats about you know getting your fuel or whatever else happens to be part of it it's really no different for an artist you just need to embrace the business side of your art and set aside some time for it the reality is most of us can't paint for eight to ten hours a day anyway we need a diversion we need a break we need to get our mind away from the painting step away is what they say right so use some of that time for marketing I also think the more time you can spend on marketing the more you'll sell and actually the less you'll have to paint I know that sounds counterintuitive, but the best artists, the most successful artists are the ones who paint fewer paintings and get more money for them because they're in such high demand. So if you were to take, for instance, 20% of your time or one day a week out of a five-day week, you would crush it. You would just totally change everything about your life in terms of marketing. Now you got to get up to speed. You got to learn marketing. You got to understand it a little bit more. Sounds like you already do, but your life could change and you'd sell a lot more paintings just by taking 20% of your time. Or maybe just take, uh, you know, two or three hours uh, every day in between painting times or around lunchtime or whatever time. You know, pick out the times you think are best for your painting. When do you do your best painting? Have the clearest head for that. What are the times when your painting isn't best? And you can use that for your marketing, your planning, your shipping, those kinds of things. Uh, just like painting, you need to give yourself permission to know that marketing takes time. It's not going to be overnight, but it's going to be a little overwhelming in the beginning. But just pick one or two things to focus on. Don't get too overwhelmed. I've got a blog on marketing. Uh, it's at artmarketing.com, and it's free. You can get a lot of ideas there. The next question comes from Henry in Washington. It doesn't say which Washington, state or city. Anyway, from time to time, I get requests to donate my art for a silent auction. What are your thoughts on participating in silent auctions? You know, I get this question a lot, Henry, and I always give the same answer. Artists don't like them because they think they're not going to get paid for their painting and they think getting a tax deduction is impossible. Although tax laws recently changed, you might be able to deduct more than time and materials now. But Consider it an advertising expense. Would you pay a lot of money to get in front of a lot of affluent people who could buy your paintings? Of course you would. So consider this that opportunity. Now, you don't necessarily want to do every silent auction. You want to do the ones that have rich people or affluent people, you know, people who can spend money, people who are going to spend money fighting over those prizes. But you don't just give up a painting. You always want to look for what can I get in return. So in my book, for instance, I talk about preeminence marketing and how to become preeminent. And to be preeminent means that you're going to uh, be highlighted. You're going to have something special. So what I would do is I'd say something like this. You say, when they ask you, say, you know, let's, let's get on the phone. I want to talk about this. You say, listen, I'm going to give you a really expensive painting, you know, a painting worth a couple thousand dollars or maybe more. And um, it's probably going to be one of the best and most sought after prizes but in exchange, I need you to do the following. Number one, I want you to feature my painting on all of your advertising and marketing postcards, website, etc., as one of the primary items in the silent auction. My painting uh, and my photo needs to be the most prominent and needs to include my name and maybe the name of the painting and say that it's one of the top prizes and it's valued at whatever the price happens to be we agree on. Secondly, your signage at the event needs to do the same thing. Number three, 
I need admission to the event. Number four, and of course you need admission so you can work the room. Number four, I need access to the list of everybody who attended or preferably even everybody who was invited and I need the ability to uh, contact those people. Now, if, they're not, if you're not gonna let me do that, then I need to be able to put out a business card bowl and we'll have an, a separate prize for another painting and uh, I'll collect the business cards and I'll contact them on my own, subtly and uh, tastefully, of course. And uh, since I'm giving you this valuable prize, I also need you to recognize me on stage. Just a simple introduction. We'd like our special guest, the artist who donated this top prize, your name, to stand up and you know give him a round of applause kind of a thing and maybe read a small you know paragraph about me so that, that makes, it makes sense. This is going to help me because if I'm going to spend a uh, couple hundred thousand, I mean a couple hundred thousand, well it could be I suppose, but I'm going to spend a couple thousand dollars worth of painting uh, on you and frames and everything else, I need to get something in return. Now, what you want to think about, there's 500 wealthy people in that room, uh, would it be worth a $2,000 painting? You bet it would. Of course, you, you need an immediate plan to follow up with that list, you need a way to make sure that they get your marketing materials or get invited to your website or your studio. And you need to understand that one time of anything isn't the answer. So you want to do multiple charity events. And if you do that consistently, you become a local superstar. We have a whole program in our art marketing in a box thing where we talk about how to do this. It's very powerful. Anyway, it's going to be uncomfortable in the beginning to ask because you're not used to doing that. But um, And if you want, you can have somebody else do it for you. Have somebody who uh, can represent you in that case so that you don't cave in. That's a possibility. Anyway, I hope it helps. And I hope this marketing minute has been valuable. Well, this podcast is brought to you by the Plein Air Convention, where you can learn from at least 80 of the world's top artists. And it's for less than the cost of a single workshop. You get your choice of a ton and you get, you know, one price fits all, right? You get everything. And there's four stages. This year in San Francisco, we're also going to go up on the last day in wine country and paint. That's going to be a blast. Maybe we'll have some wine. Hmm. And we're learning and painting together every day. Join us. It's going to be a ball. San Francisco has been our most requested place yet. You want to learn more at plenairconvention.com. And by the way, if you're new to painting, don't feel self-conscious about it. We've got a beginner's course that you can take. Uh, we, we have a lot of beginners who come, and we'd love for you to come. And whether you've done a painting or not, you know, you're going to learn so much. You're going to be kind of overwhelmed by all this, but it's really fun, and you're going to meet a lot of people, learn about the whole plein air world and the people in it, and you're going to become part of the family. And this is going to be called Homecoming, right? Also, this has been brought to you by the Easel Brush Clip, the cool tool for painters. Just clip it on the side of your easel. Keep your brushes right there. Easelbrushclip.com. Uh, Sunday mornings, I have a blog about life. It's called Sunday Coffee. You can learn about it at coffeewitheric.com. Com. Well, this is always fun. Let's do it again sometime, like next week, perhaps. I'll see you then. My name is Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher and the founder of Plein Air Magazine. Remember, it's a big world out there, so I want you to go out and paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye. <laughs>